All right. So the title of the talk is Dissolving Hate, and from the opening treatment, certainly I hope you have a feel for it. Not just an, an idea, but an actual, an actual feel for the love and the peace that is, that is here, that is now, that is God, that is present. And it is that which dissolves hate. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on in the world around us today, some of the things that are on people's mind as, as judged by what people are telling me, uh, what I'm reading on, on social media from the different posts from many of the people that I know, many different people. And I would, I would guess that right now it's, things seem <laughs> certainly to be a little crazy. Uh, if you read the email I sent out last night, <clears throat> and as you know, I'm a bit of a history buff. But when Cornwallis was defeated at Yorktown during the, uh, the American Revolution, he sent his troops out to surrender their arms, according to the terms of surrender. And the band that played, the British band that played while they were marching out to surrender, played a traditional tune. And the tune that they played was The World Turned Upside Down. The World Turned Upside Down. And you have to imagine for, for those men, those people at that time, that it certainly seemed like the world had been turned upside down. Here the, the self-proclaimed greatest army in the world had been defeated by a combination of back, backwoods militiamen, the Continental Army and the French and, and other, other people who came to volunteer. And yet there they were, defeated. The United States had, <clears throat> or America, wasn't even the United States yet. The American colonies had done something that, that no one else had done before. Had thrown off British rule. The world was turned upside down. We have another example in, in literature, American literature, of what it's like when people feel the world is turned upside down. And that was uh, the legend of Sleepy Hollow, Rip Van Winkle, Washington Irving's tale. And that was about an earlier time. And there was a time when the, when the Dutch had come and settled the New York area. <clears throat> and then the British came. And, and the satire that Washington Irving was writing about was Rip Van Winkle fell asleep for 20 years. And he, when he woke up, the whole world had changed. The whole world had changed. The Dutch were no longer in charge. The British were in charge. Everything was different. And Rip Van Winkle was trying to make sense of it. And if we keep keep those things in mind, what I, what I see people struggling with, what I hear people struggling with over the events of what's what's gone on in Charlottesville, what's gone on in Barcelona, is how do you make sense of all this? How do we make sense of all this? What is it all about? What what are we to do about it? What are we to do about it? It seems like people are just are just talking past one another. They're not not even listening, not even trying to understand, but but just looking for an opportunity. When I studied communication styles, we called it the ping pong match. There was a ping pong match style of communication. It's like somebody somebody hits the ball to you, and, and your whole objective is to hit it back. They hit it to you, and you hit it back, and you're trying to score a point. So people aren't listening to understand or or to to develop empathy with another person. They are just listening long enough to figure out how they are going to slam back, how they are going to slam back and get a point. There are people who are genuinely concerned. They have, they have genuine concerns. They're, and keep in mind, we're, we're talking about things mostly at an emotional level here, not even at an intellectual level, but at an emotional level. And they don't understand what's going on, and they're, and they're afraid, and they're angry, and they're upset. And then there are people who are just trying to trying to get in the middle and capitalize on on whatever is going on, and put forward whatever their viewpoint might be, somehow tie whatever it is, whatever their agenda is, or trying to tie it into whatever is going on. So it's very confusing times, very confusing to to many people. It's very confusing. 
And I think one of the things that, that we look at as we here in this country look at it is where did this hate come from? Where did this anger come from? Where did all this fear come from? You know, What's bringing it to the surface? Has it always been here? What's bringing it to the surface now if it's always been here? But more importantly, what can we do about it? What can we, what can we as an individual, what can we as a spiritual being do about it? Now, when we talk about these things from a spiritual point of view, you know, I'm, I'm observing things as they appear to be in the world of appearances, but I always try to take things back to cause. And cause is consciousness. Consciousness. Everything is consciousness. By consciousness, we mean what you think intellectually, what you believe, which is more than a thought. It's a thought that you believe to be true. You have some type of expectation that it's true. And then there's the emotion. That's what you feel. What do we feel? And those are very hard for people to get in touch with what they feel. Feel things and, and we don't know why we feel them. Th things come up, emotions come up, they well up, and, and we don't even know where they came from. And yet they're, they're up and we are engaged and we are reacting and we are responding and, and we, are, we are in motion. And we don't even know why. We're studying some of this in, in the Skype group on Wednesday nights about just observing when things come up. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Why do I feel that way? What's happening here? Everything is consciousness. Right? Everything is consciousness. It's the first thing that we want to remember today. What we are seeing going on in the world today is the perfect outpicturing of the consciousness as it existed in the recent past and certainly as it exists now. That's the first thing we want to remember. The second thing is, is that everything that you and I experience is a result of our own consciousness. That is that part of consciousness that we, that we can directly <coughs> change. Now, that's a hard one for a lot of people to accept, the responsibility that <clears throat> everything that comes into my life, everything that goes out of my life, everything that happens in my life is somehow a reflection of consciousness. Because we get sick and we say, well, I wasn't thinking about that disease, or, or we have a financial setback and we think, well, I, I, I wasn't thinking about poverty. But nevertheless, there's a, there's a law in the universe it is done unto us according to our belief. And what we experience in our lives is a result of consciousness. Whether we are aware of what that consciousness is or whether we are unaware. Remember we talked <clears throat> the other week about the example of the iceberg. You know, We might be aware of the 10% that's above the waterline. We're not aware of the 90% that's below the waterline. And then we're not aware of the infinity below that because no one has ever plumbed the depths of consciousness. So we want to consider, one thing that we want to consider here is, is that human consciousness, the human race, human consciousness as we know it, <clears throat> has not really changed a whole lot in thousands of years. Emmett Fox tells us is we can read the Bible and we can read about the Pharaoh and we can read about Moses and we can read about things that were written down over 4,000 years ago. And we understand them. And we understand them because we are not too different than the states of mind that are represented by those characters in the Bible. Human consciousness has not changed very much in all those years. He tells us we're not far removed from the cave. Human consciousness is evolving. It is moving forward. It is, it is slowly awakening. We have great lights that come into the world and show us the way, motivate us on, inspire us on. The Buddhists, the Christs, the saints, the great teachers. But in general, human consciousness is moving along very slowly. Very slowly. 
So the, so the, the root cause of what we're seeing, we're, we're looking at in, in the world, we're looking at hate, we're looking at violence, we're looking at anger, we're looking at fear, we're looking at all these things, but they've been with us for thousands and thousands of years. We may be more aware of them today in our country because things are happening close to home. Constantly in the news, constantly on social media, but, but these sorts of things are happening all the time in the world, in the world around us. There are atrocities happening all around the world at, at different times. There's genocide, there's, there's hate, there, there's, all, there's all of these different things that are going on. <clears throat> But there are times we're just unaware of them. We're, we're sheltered from them. Now, I'm not condoning them by saying, well, it's normal, it's going on. What I'm saying is, is the root cause is with us. The root cause is with us. And this root cause is in the human consciousness, is in the human psyche. And if we accept the premise that what we're seeing is a perfect outpicturing of human consciousness, and we say to ourselves, well, what can I do about that? What, what, what can I do to, to heal? You know, <clears throat> we get uncomfortable. I think, I think that's, that's something else that we, we become aware of. We, we become uncomfortable when things like this happen, and we want to we wanna solve it. We want to we kind of make the problem uh, go away. Sometimes we don't solve it. We just want it to go away. You know? just, just make it go away. You'll see, you'll see that. Some people are saying, well, turn, turn off the news. Turn off the news. Well, there's, there's probably some merit in that because the news as a medium, particularly on, on television, but the news in general, they have to capture our attention. And the way that they do that is, is by arousing the emotions of anger and fear. If they, can, if they, on their breaking news lead-off story, if they can hook us with anger or fear, they can keep us tuned to the channel so that we'll watch the next commercial. That's kind of the way that medium works. So we don't have to be hooked into the anger and the fear. But simply turning away from what's going on, simply pretending it's not there, is, is not going to help it to get better either. So I think we want to be aware, but we don't want to be hooked. We don't want to be entangled with it. We don't want to be, we don't want to become part of the problem. We want to be the solution. So what is it in human consciousness, first of all, what is it in human consciousness that is going on that is outpicturing as the violence, that is outpicturing as, as the animosity and the hate and the fear and, and, and all of these things that are going on, you know. And then what is it that changes human consciousness? That is the big question. That is the $64,000 question for all of us. If everything that I experience in my life is a result of what I believe, it's a result of my consciousness, then the question really becomes, well, how do I change consciousness? If I wish to have a different experience in life, how do I change consciousness? And then you roll that up to the bigger picture. And what is it in all of human consciousness and then how does that change? What, ch what changes consciousness? What brings about a change in consciousness? So if we look at, at the message that we get from the New Testament Christianity, we might, we might take away from it, it is done unto you according to your belief. If we look at Old Testament, we might take away, as you think and believe in your heart, so are you. If we look at Buddhism, it tells us that everything we experience is a result of what we have thought. If we look at the Stoic philosophers, they will tell us what the mind can conceive and believe the mind can achieve. If we look at Dr. Holmes, he says, change your thinking, change your life. All of this, all of this is telling us in one way or another, consciousness consciousness. We must change consciousness. So if we think back at what we're, what we're looking at in the, in the violence in the world today, if we, if, you know, it's kind of, we can't comprehend 
how people could do this to one another. We can't comprehend how how somebody could could drive their car into a crowd of people. We can't under, comprehend how somebody could could blow themselves up to to kill others and kill themselves, or or, or go into a place where where innocent people are are gathered and just start shooting. It's just it's not comprehensible. We cannot understand it. You know, we, what in the world is going on? What in the world is going on? And I found, of all places, I found I found a little meme from George Lucas' Star Trek, and it was it had the wisdom of Yoda. And it had Yoda saying that <clears throat> fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate. And hate leads to suffering. And I thought, there it is. There it is. That little green guy had it. It's just that simple. If you look up in, in psychology, if you look up the definition of hatred, one of the definitions is, is that hatred is a result of a perceived threat, an imminent threat. And what happens is, is, is we live with that threat for so long. We live in the fear and the anger of that threat for so long that it becomes hatred. It no longer is <clears throat> something that you can, you can think about or talk about. It's just there. It's just an animosity. It's just there. But it comes from a fear. It comes from a perceived threat. It comes from a fear. And what we're told about, about fear, that fear is, is according to the, to the definitions I read, fear is kind of a normal reaction to, to a threat. Something happens that we feel threatened by, and naturally we become afraid. It's, it's an instinct. It's an instinctive reaction that is really designed to protect us, that is designed to keep us alive. You know, you walking, imagine you're walking through the woods at night, and all of a sudden you hear, you hear something off to your side. You know, whoa. All of a sudden, your senses go on alert. You're afraid. You know, your 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 eyes get a little bit clearer. Your hearing gets a little bit better. Now you're tuned in. You know, your your body is kind of listening for that threat. There's a perceived threat there. And once the fear comes up, once the perceived threat is there, and once we start to react to it, we can go a couple of ways. This is the fight or flight response. So we can withdraw from the situation. That's flight. And if we do that, then we just call it, the psychologists just call that fear. I was in the woods. I heard something. I didn't like it. I left the woods. I was afraid. I'm out of the woods. The danger is over. The perceived threat is over. My fear is gone. The other response is the fight response. <clears throat> we come, become afraid, and rather than withdraw, or perhaps that's not an option for us, we realize we must engage. We must engage. So we become aggressive. You know, the, the, the fight adrenaline comes up, and, and we're going to go find whatever this is that's in the woods that's making noise. We're going to go charge at it. We're going to get a stick, and we're going to make lots of noise. And, and we're going to yell, and we're going to go after it, and all those kind of things. And when we do that, it's called anger. Anger. So, so the anger seems to be, be an emotional response that we, we use as humans to go into action, to go into action. And it's kind of interesting if, <clears throat> when I look back at, at human beings and, and change, Many times people will not change until they get angry. They have to get upset about something in, in order to find the energy and the motivation to change. They live with something being a certain way for, for a long time, and then all of a sudden they get angry, and then they do something. So the anger, think of the anger then in human terms, think of the anger as being kind of an emotional response that gets us ready to act. But if we stay, if we stay angry for, for a long enough period of time, it becomes hatred. It becomes hatred. We're angry. We don't even know why we're angry anymore. We're always, always on the edge 
of doing something, always on the edge of attack. And that's the violence. And that's where the violence comes from. <clears throat> so walking it backwards in, in, a, in a human, from a human perspective, so we can get back to the cause, which is going to be in spirit or consciousness. What is it? What is it that we want? What is it that you and I want? We see, we see the violence in the news. We 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 sense the hate that is there, and we wish we could do something. But what can I do about that? What can I possibly do about that? And the first thing we can do is at least we can understand where it comes from. So if we can get back to where it comes from, then maybe we can do something at the level of cause. So we wish to dissolve hate. We wish to dissolve hate. You know, if, if we all if we all were the fairy godmother and we could wave our magic wand and, and sprinkle our sprinkle our magic powder around, we would go around the world and we would just we would want to dissolve hate. Because if we could dissolve the hate, if we could dissolve the hate, the violence would stop. But if we wish to dissolve the hate, we have to dissolve the anger because hate comes from anger. And if we wish to dissolve anger, we must dissolve the fear because fear causes anger. And now we are starting to get a little bit closer to the root cause and to what we can do and to how we can do it. So what is it that casts out fear? What is it that casts out fear? And what we're told in, in the New Testament is this perfect love, perfect love casts out fear. If you don't know love, if you, don't, if you know fear, you don't know love. And in other places we're told, and if you don't know love, you don't know God. So this sounds kind of uh, Pollyannish, you know. It sounds just a little bit too easy. All you need is love, you know. We'll just we'll just put on the Beatles album and we'll hold hands and sway, and all you need is love, and all of this will go away. And that's not what we're talking about. It it could be part of it, but it's not what we're talking about. We're talking about perfect love, perfect love. If we wish to dissolve the hate, we must understand what perfect love is, which if we say there's perfect love, we're implying that there's imperfect love or less than perfect love. So what is perfect love? And then how do I practice it? How do I practice it? Now that's, that's a very important point. How do I, me, individually, how do I practice it? Because many times what, what people want to do is they see an event like things that are going on in the world today and we say well how do we make those people over there change what do we have to do to those people over there what do we have to do for those people over there in order to get them to change and as Gandhi is often quoted as saying which People argue whether he really said it or not, or somebody else said it. We must become the change we wish to see in the world. Right? So it's like being on the airplane and the oxygen mask drop down, and what we're told is, is if you're traveling with a child, you have to put the mask on yourself first, and then you put the mask on the child. And the reason for that is, is if you pass out, both of you are in trouble. Whereas if you get the mask on yourself, then you will be able to help this child. So in our desire to be helpful, we must start with ourselves. How can I experience and practice perfect love, whatever that means? How can I experience that? And then what benefit might that have to others?
what benefit might that have to others? So this concept of perfect love, uh, we probably need to spend just a couple minutes talking about that. This concept of perfect love, divine love, agape love, the love of a Christ, the love of a Buddha, is different, is different than the human concept of love. The human concept of love is pretty much conditional or transactional. We love people in our family because we're born into the family. And there's a sense of kinship and a sense of oneness and, and a sense that, well, we ought to love them. It's a social responsibility. You should love your parents. You should love your siblings. You should love your cousins. That's what expect, is expected of you. <clears throat> when you grow up, you should get married and you should raise a family and you should have children and you should love them. That's what's expected of you. And in that regard, love is a contract. Love is a fulfillment of a contract. There is an expectation. And if we are to feel good about ourselves, if we are to satisfy our ego that we are good people, we need to do that which is expected of us. This is what, this is what moral behavior within society is. This, is. this is how societies kind of, and cultures kind of influence us, right? shame and, and guilt and rewards. This is why if you're a member of a culture and you do something that is a taboo in that culture, you're ostracized. This is the greatest punishment that the culture can give you is to cast you out, to put you out. This is in, in the Bible, you know, Cain killed Abel. They put the mark on his head so that no, nobody would kill him and then they cast him out. This is the greatest taboo. This is what happens. You're excommunicated from your religion those sorts of things. So our human concept of love is not perfect love. It's, it's good. It's good as far as it goes. It's better than not having love. But it is conditional. It is transactional. It falls within the, it, within the context and the bounds of roles, responsibilities, and relationships. We can love people uh, if, <clears throat> if we have a relationship with them that is deemed as, as an appropriate relationship for loving. But other people, well, you know, we need to be careful. We can't love them because we don't have a relationship with them. We can love people if our role if our role allows us to do that or requires us to do that. We love our children, we love our spouse, we love our family members, for example. But what if our role does not include those people over there, whoever those people happen to be? What if our relationships, our current understanding of our relationships do not include those people over there? Then can we love them? This is where the idea of perfect love comes in. And I was watching uh, some, somebody, uh, one, of my, one of my friends on Facebook posted a video <clears throat> and I watched a brief clip of. And it was somebody who is part of what, what would be considered today to be a hate group. What we would look at today and say, well, that's a hate group. And the journalist was interviewing this person and said, well, you know, aren't you supposed to, to love? And the person they were interviewing immediately, immediately went back to a biblical quote and, and justified that I only need to love people like me. I only need to love members of my own tribe. So therefore, I don't have to love everyone. See? So in, in that person's mind, in the way that they espouse their beliefs, there was a limit to love. Love went as far as those people, this person included, in his, his circle of love, whatever that might be. And it didn't extend to everyone. But only to that select group. So people justify, they justify their anger and their hate and their fear of other groups because those groups are not like us. 
And we don't have to love them. We don't have to try to understand them. We don't have to care about them. Because they're outside our circle. They're outside our circle. And this is no different today than it was 4,000 years ago. In fact, if you go back and you, and you read the Old Testament, the Old Testament is full of violence. It is full of violence where God was giving permission to people to go attack those people over there because they're not like us. Now we have to understand, or at least my understanding, I'll explain it to you, is uh, God, God didn't tell them to do it. But they justified what they wanted to do by saying God said it was okay. So in many cases, human beings have created God in their image and likeness instead of, as we're told, God created us in its image and likeness. So people use this idea of otherness and apartness and separateness to justify, to justify their fear, to justify their anger, to justify their hate, to justify their violence, and even to the point where people would say, well, we had to kill those people because they were God's enemies. We were doing God's work by being violent. And we have to step back and say, is that divine consciousness or is that human consciousness rationalizing? Is that human consciousness justifying? God sends the rain to fall on the just and the unjust alike, is what we're told in the New Testament. The same well does not give forth sweet and sour water. And we must stop to recognize that we are all, we are all God's children, God's creation. We all come from the same place. We all go to the same place. And this idea of separateness and apartness and otherness is the one that needs to be dissolved. If I really love, if I really love, and I'm not talking about a romantic relationship of being in love, I'm talking about love. If I truly love another, would I harm them? Would I wish for them anything that I wouldn't even wish for myself, right? There's a golden rule. Do unto others as they would do unto yourself. People, people try to follow that as a rule instead of understanding what Dr. Holmes tells us. I'm not my brother's keeper. I am my brother. I am my brother. You and I are one. This is the perfect love. This is the agape love. This is the divine love that we're talking about that doesn't want anything from another. I don't love you because of, of what I can get from you if you love me back. I don't love you so you will love me back and I'll feel good about myself. I just love because I am love. I am an expression of love. I feel the oneness. I feel the unity. I could no, no more harm you than I could harm myself. I could no more steal from you than I could steal from myself. If I put my hand into your wallet and took $20, I would be taking it out of my own pocket because we are truly one. We are truly one. So it is in this experience of perfect love, not human love, not conditional love, not transactional love, not love based on role, not, not love based on relationship, but just love based on the isness of our being, which is love, which is one, which is unity. It is that perfect love that casts out all fear. Because how can I be afraid of myself? And there's a tough one for us. There's a tough one for us. Because many traditional religions tell us not to trust ourselves. 
that we are wicked, that we are fallen, that, that we, our bodies are evil and we need to be against them. We need to beat ourselves into submission, you know, the, the spiritual practice, if you want to call it a spiritual practice, of, of self-flagellation, of people whipping the flesh. Now, there's more, there's more to that than, than just a self-torture, right? There's the, when the body is in so much pain, then, <clears throat> then the intellect and the ego can let go. So, so there's something to the spiritual practices of deprivation that, 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 that kind of influence the body to get it to a point of letting go. But I'm talking about the concept that the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. You cannot trust because mankind has fallen. All of these ideas that, that our culture has drilled into us that we can't even love ourselves. We can't even love ourselves. If we are to start with perfect love, we have to start by learning to love ourselves. We have to start by getting beyond the intellect's concept of who and what we are, beyond the ego's fantasy of who and what we are. And we must learn to go within to find that center of perfection that has always been with us, that always will be with us, that, that the spark, the poet tells us, the spark that we can desecrate but we can never destroy. And we must find that perfection within us that is worth loving perfectly. And until we can do that, there's no sense trying to do anything to influence those people out there because we haven't put the oxygen mask on ourselves. We don't have anything to give. We have platitudes. We have opinions. We have emotions. We have anger. We have all of the human things to give, but the human things are not going to solve these problems. The root cause of these problems is that we have not yet developed perfect love. How do we change our consciousness? How do we start with ourselves? The thing that changes consciousness is our contact with the divine, our experience of the presence of God. Joel Goldsmith says it is just the experience of the presence of God. That is the only thing. And his, his technique, now he, this is the mystics, and the mystics come at it from meditation. Just sit and be in the presence of God. Get the ego to quiet down. Get the intellect to quiet down. <clears throat> Just sit and be in the presence of God. Be still and know. Emmett Fox and Dr. Holmes were kind of coming at it from a more practical approach, which is, the process of scientific prayer, the process of treatment. That when we sit and we do our treatment for peace, right? Well, what are we doing? We are treating our consciousness for peace. We are treating ourselves to eliminate from that part of consciousness that we are everything and anything that is unlike God's peace. And as we are doing that treatment, two things happen. First is, is that in the treatment itself, as we bring ourselves into the feeling of the peace that passes understanding, we are experiencing the presence of God, and that is changing our consciousness. And we are setting into motion a law of mind, the power that responds according to our belief, and it then continues to do its work to produce whatever change or changes as needs must be in our consciousness for the experience of peace. And the peace is already there because the omnipresence of God's peace is within us. So we don't have to create peace. We don't have to tr try to grab peace and bring it to us. We don't have to act and force and be angry. To bring about peace, we have to dissolve everything within us, within consciousness, that is unlike the peace that is already there. 
It's like the sculptor who says, the famous story about Michelangelo, I don't know whether it's true or not, <clears throat> but he says, you, you, you find the angel in the stone and then you carve away everything that's not like the angel and you're left with the statue of the angel. Can you see the perfection in there, even though it is surrounded by things that, that are not like it? Can we see the perfection? Can we see the peace? Can we take time? Can we take time? That's the big deal. Take time to simply be with the peace of God, the peace that passes understanding. Now, as we do this, the first thing to keep in mind is that as we do this, our personal experience, we can let go of fear in our own lives because many times people say, well, if I, if I do that to myself, those crazies might still come into my neighborhood. They may, they may, but they'll leave you alone. They'll leave you alone. You have to become convinced in faith that your experience is a result of your consciousness. And throw 10,000 fall at thy side, no harm shall come to thee. This is what the Bible is trying to tell us. Start with where you are. Start with what you have, which is your consciousness. Focus on dissolving hate in your own self by developing perfect love. And as you do that, because we are all connected, no, no person is an island. We are all connected. There's no wave that's isolated from the ocean. As we do that, it has a healing effect on all consciousness. It has a feeling, healing effect on race consciousness. That is why in the opening treatment I said, let's extend that bridge of light, that bridge of love, that bridge of peace that comes from our hearts. Let's extend that to everyone who is crying out for the experience of God's peace. As we become the change we wish to see in the world, we become a healing bomb for those who are ready to heal. <clears throat> now there are those who are not ready to heal. And we have to leave them be. They will eventually awaken. They will eventually come to change. We need to focus on what it is that we must do now. Which is to consciously, deliberately, assertively, <laughs> become that instrument of perfect love that we were brought here to be. So when you go to work tomorrow, people are going to say to you, ain't it crazy? Oh my God, what's happened to the world? Ain't it crazy? What can we do about it? And what we can do is we can pray an affirmative prayer. We can meditate. And most importantly, we can be God's instrument of love. Before, before we had baseball cards, we had we had holy cards. We had cards with with the pictures of our of our patron saints on them. And during the First World War in Europe, someone had a holy card, which was a picture of Saint Francis of Assisi. A mystic. And on the back of this holy card, this, per, this unknown person wrote a prayer. We don't know whether it was an original prayer to that person, if they composed it themselves, if they heard it someplace else. We don't know. But it became known as the prayer of St. Francis. And in popular mythology, people will say, well, that was the prayer St. Francis said. No, it wasn't. It was a prayer that was found on the back of the holy card. And the first line is, O oh Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. I invite you this week, I invite you to take that one line, O oh Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Begin by sowing love in your own consciousness, in your own heart. Become the perfect love that will heal the world. 
And then that love will spill out. That love will touch other hearts. That love will be the beacon on the hill, the light that has been <clears throat> taken from under the bushel. When we look at the events in the world and somebody asks us, what can we possibly do? The answer is to become perfect love. Everything else will fall short. Let's go to work at cause. Let's undo the consciousness of fear, which leads to anger, which leads to hate, which leads to violence. Let's just love everyone. Bless our enemies. Pray for them. Love them. Realize that God is everywhere present. Dr. Holmes tells us when deep calls unto deep, deep answers. And that's essentially what we're talking about here. Go within. Go deep. Remember last week I said dig deeper. Go deep. Find that love within you. And let that love call out to every heart that's afraid. And let it be the healing balm for them. You are God's instrument of peace. You are sowing love. You are a gift to this world. And so it is.